what competition really means is the freedom of any entrepreneur to enter. Perfect competition, not perfect competition in the model sense, but absolute competition that nobody is blocked from exercising a good idea that he or she may have because somebody else is privileged. No privilege. Israel Kirzner is one of the foremost economists of our time. He has taken the insights of the tradition known as the Austrian School of Economics into new areas of economic science. His book, Competition and Entrepreneurship, was a landmark in the development of this field of thought, extending Austrian insights to the role of the entrepreneur in the market process. As a graduate student at New York University, Israel Kirzner studied under the world-renowned Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. There, in the Mises' seminars, he was taken with the idea of the market as a dynamic process, eschewing the static model of equilibrium, then current among mainstream economists. This early experience at NYU, with diverse, even conflicting approaches to economics, led to his first book, The Economic Point of View, and fueled a lifelong interest in the differing approaches to the discipline. I was fortunate to have a conversation with Professor Kersner on the School of Economics, known as the Austrian School, its various insights, and its relationship to a concern for liberty. Professor Kersner exhibited great integrity and depth, only matched by his devotion to liberty. Liberty Fund welcomes you to a conversation with Professor Israel Kersner. How do you explain the fact that here is a science, uh, at least um, propounded to be a science, that nevertheless has these continuing competing schools? I believe it is, it is a tribute to the subtlety of economic insights that, has, that is responsible for the different ways of seeing what is central or what is peripheral to economic understanding. So if, for example, the classical economists thought they were developing a science of wealth, uh, later economists began to realize they were not talking about an objective wealth, they were talking about something maybe maximization, mm -hmm. or they were talking about um, uh, exchange, or they were talking about human action. These are different related uh, dimensions of the same central phenomena. And that is why they have developed over time uh, different conceptions of what is the essence of, of economics altogether. And uh, Mises was fascinated by that. And uh, he, he, his idea led to my being fascinated by that. And Do I find think... myself coming back to that again and again. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you take to be the central tenets of Austrian economics. Uh, Austrian economics is a tradition. It's ra rather than a cut and dried body of thought. It has evolved over about 125 years. Uh, so to list the tenets is not to list some of the founding, some of, some of the elements in a founding constitution. Mm -hmm. It's to list some of, some of the ideas and insights that have evolved during this period. Uh, let me just digress for a moment. The late Fritz Machlup, uh, who was an eminent economist, and who was trained in Vienna and was always proud to be seen as an Austrian econ economist, he made various lists at various times as to what Austrian economics consists of. I've always found that his list was incomplete. And that indicates that Austrian economics is indeed an, evol an evolving tradition. What he learned in the 1920s and what he uh, was able to crystallize into a uh, list of insights and points uh, reflected what was being taught in Vienna in the 1920s. Uh, 
by uh, the late night, by the late uh, 20th century, Austrian, the Austrian economics had evolved, the tradition had evolved. So coming back to a list of the tenets of the tenets of Austrian economics, I would say, of course, subjectivism would be the most important insight, by which we mean, and perhaps we can explore this further, but by which we mean very briefly, uh, the idea that uh, what influences human action is not any physical phenomenon per se, but the way that physical phenomenon is interpreted by the human mind. I sometimes give a little example. Uh, if one finds a statistical connection between the degree of rainfall and the uh, number of umbrellas per capita purchased, mm. uh, one might say, well, rainfall produces and produces a demand for umbrellas. An Austrian would say, well, that's true, but we have to understand why it's true. And it's true not because rainfall generates umbrellas, but because people don't like to get wet. Exploring a bit further, we would say it's because people, ex if they got, they got wet today, they expect they might get wet next week. So this involves expectations. Mm -hmm. So subjectivism involves understanding by the economist that what motivates action is the human mind and the way the human mind interprets phenomena that, uh, that that person has experienced or which that person, as a consequence, anticipates. So that would be one important uh, tenet mm -hmm. of Austrian economics. Uh, another important tenet would be the purposefulness of human action. The idea that human beings are not automatons, they're not robots, they don't act in mechanical fashion, they act as choosing beings aiming at purposes. Uh, the purposes at which they aim are chosen by themselves. There may be other disciplines that can explain to some extent how certain purposes rather than others, certain objectives, certain goals rather than others come to be adopted and pursued. The economist begins by uh, taking as a starting point the fact that human beings do have objectives and goals and purposes. And we understand action, we understand the decisions that people make, the actions they take, we understand these as being motivated by purposes. Mm -hmm. It may seem almost trivial uh, to make this point, but in economics it's far from trivial. Uh, economics, uh, mainstream economics, uh, has crystallized the notion of the decision uh, into a maximizing exercise where the goals are in the background and there is, a, there is somehow an objective function and individuals act to maximize an outcome without any uh, real feel for the purposefulness of human action. Uh, whereas Austrians uh, remain at all times fully conscious and influenced by their understanding of the purposefulness of human action. Does this also lead into the way the market uh, looks to the Austrians uh, as an arena for discovery rather than just a playing out of desire maximization? Uh, I believe that a discovery idea is maybe linked to some extent with the purposefulness idea, but I think it comes in, as in, a, in a, from a different tenet that I would okay. come to, and that is the role of information, knowledge, and the place for ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, in Austrian economics, uh, we operate very carefully with a full awareness of the context of human ignorance. Uh, again, this is uh, a point at, with which mainstream economists uh, to some extent would disagree. They might agree with it in principle, but in practice they assume perfect knowledge, or, or to a large extent their economics is based on the assumption of perfect mm -hmm. knowledge. Austrian economics uh, involves an explicit understanding and recognition of the nature of human ignorance, the limitations of knowledge, and the problems that arise therefrom. Uh, Mises, of course, called his book, his magnum opus, he called it Human Action. And that was a remarkable title to give a book in economics. Ambitious. <laughs> Ambitious. Uh, and what he meant by human action captures what he saw as the essence of the analytical building blocks with which to construct a social science, in particular economics.
action involves decision making in the face of an uncertain future with, with, uh, in a framework of limited knowledge. So that would be a second, uh, excuse me, I guess a third tenet. Yes. Uh, one other tenet that I don't believe we've uh, mentioned yet would be the role of time mm -hmm. in Austrian economics. Uh, this goes back t uh, certainly until uh, since Bon Bavirk in the 1880s, where uh, he pointed out that decision making is very much involved with the future. Time enters into Austrian considerations in an essential way, not simply uh, in a matter of putting time subscripts under, <coughs> under variables, but in fact recognizing that people see, see their own actions within a perspective of futurity. They yeah, could you tell us a little bit of an example, how that works out and say, in a decision, uh, buying a house or a car or taking a job, employment or something like that? Right. Uh, when one buys a house or when one buys a suit, uh, it's very easy to uh, fall into the error of thinking of this as an object. I'm buying this house as an object, I'm buying this garment as an object. Austrians recognize when you buy a garment, you're buying a flow of future services. When you buy a house, you're buying a flow of future residential services. And consequently, a decision as to how, as to how much to pay for the house, how much to offer for the house, how much to offer for the garment, uh, is very much uh, dependent upon one's perception of what the future is. One thinks of the future. And I think there's, not, there's nothing new in this to, uh, to, anybody in the, uh, to anybody in the real world, that when you buy a house, you're thinking of the future, what, what your career will be yes. in the future, and but that's true of every of every commodity mm -hmm. one buys, uh, certainly for a capital good like a house, or even a short-term capital good like a garment, but even if one buys an article of, of direct consumption of food, one's thinking about when one will use this food in the future. It's not simply a question of time subscript, that is not simply a question of summer or winter, it's a question of seeing the future as in perspective, you think in space. We think of the future, but we think of uh, distance as coming together in perspective. In the same way, there is a time discount factor, and that has entered into Austrian economics very importantly. And I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about this uh, this separately. So these would be, I think, the major mm -hmm. the major tenets uh, which make up the Austrian view. Your work, uh, for example, in competition and entrepreneurship, uh, has marked your major contribution to the economic, uh, to the Austrian school. Tell us a little bit about this. In what way is it different from some of the previous Austrian contributions? And in what way has it enhanced the Austrian school as a science of economics? What came, it became apparent to me, and I, uh, there was a paper which I presented at uh, a Mont Pelerin Society meeting in Vichy, I believe in 1967, probably. Uh, this it, is the, the society that Hayek and that's Friedman right. that and Mises was, established. That's it. correct. That was a society founded by Hayek. Uh, it was, uh, Mises used to attend in the early years. It, was, uh, it has evolved into, a, into to really a, a, an extraordinary uh, group of, of, of individuals interested in classical liberal ideas, right. not only economics but other fields as well. And this is where you gave this paper. This is I gave this paper in Vichy, where they had a conference in, uh, I believe, 1967. And at that, I was invited to give a paper there. And uh, that paper, pre preparing that paper, uh, revealed to me the sharp distinction between the nature of the decision, the economic decision, as it had been articulated by Lionel Robbins, later Lord Robbins of the London School of Economics, in a famous book that he wrote in 1932 entitled The Nature and Significance of Economic Science. The difference between that conception of the decision and what Mises called human action. That difference, that contrast, I was finally able to pin it down. The difference between a uh, Rabinzian, as I would call it, a Rabinzian view of the, the decision and the Misesian concept of action is very simple. For Robbins, economizing decisions uh, consist in manipulating scarce means in order 
to maximize the fulfillment of competing ends, means and ends. And this was a profound, a profound articulation that Robbins was able to make under the influence of the Austrians. And Robbins had an enormous influence over subsequent microeconomics. Subsequent mainstream microeconomics can be traced back to the Austrian insights that Robbins, Robbins learned in Vienna in the late 1920s. However, those insights were confined to a view of the decision which starts out with the means being considered given and the ends, the objectives, being considered to be given. The decision consists in, in manipulating the means with respect to the given ends. It's, a, in a way, a mathematical problem. And indeed, mainstream uh, microeconomics, mainstream price theory, has pursued that point of view still pursues that point of view, and I'm not questioning its usefulness, but I'm questioning its completeness. Mm -hmm. uh, what Mises, however, recognized is that when human beings make decisions, they are acting, meaning that at the same time that they are indeed rationally arranging means to, uh, in order to achieve the goals which they have chosen for themselves, they are at the same time in the very same decision, in the very same action, they are identifying what they believe to be the available means and what they believe to be, what they are choosing to be, the relevant ends. And so that human action consists of the Rabinzian decision encased in a broader, more encompassing uh, notion of selecting the framework, which for the Rabinzian decision is considered to be given. And this is the entrepreneurial element. This is the element of initiative, of, of taking hold right, of things and right, rearranging right, them rather right. than just mechanically interacting right, right, with them. Right, right, right. And uh, when Mises has written that the, um, uh, the, every human actor, every human agent is to some extent an entrepreneur, what he meant, in my interpretation, what he meant is that in acting, a human being is identifying, choosing, mm -hmm. discovering, creating, if you will, the framework within which he's going to be acting in a rational way. Let's talk about the possibility of making, making predictions. One of the uh, ways in which uh, predictions have been held to be, in principle, possible in economics is the notion of the so-called single exit solution. If we're in a room where there's only one door through which we can make our exit, it's fairly easy to predict where we will go. We're not going to go through the window. We're not going to go through the ceiling. We're not going to drill a hole in the wall. We're going to go through, it, through the single exit. Now, from a Rabinzian perspective, uh, given the framework, given the ends and the goals and the ranking of those goals by the individual, given the available means, the rest is a calculation. Mm -hmm. It's a calculation problem. It's a mathematical problem. The solution is implicit in the data. There is a single exit. Mm -hmm. And consequently, in principle, the economists will be able to predict what's going to happen. Yes. So you see somebody walking into a supermarket. You imagine that person to have uh, his utility function. You have that person. To, uh, you have the, uh, the person to have a specific number of dollars to spend. The prices of the items are on the, uh, on the cans. Uh, the rest is, is a matter of mathematical manipulation. It's pr in principle prediction, predictable. Whereas uh, when one recognizes the broader entrepreneurial framework in which human action takes place, then it is clear that one cannot predict what a person can do because we don't know what that person believes. We don't know what that person expects. We don't know what that person is going to create. And consequently, there is a, a great uh, fundamental uh, existential difficulty in making predictions. Uh, I say this at the same time as I think one should remember that Mises himself uh, was famous in making a number of, 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 of remarkable predictions. Uh, 
But I always explain that Mises made those predictions not as economic theorist. He made those predictions as a wise man of the world who mm -hmm. was able to understand what indeed people will expect, what indeed what they will do, but not as an economic theorist. Pure economics is unable to make the kind of predictions that in principle is expected of economic theorists in the mainstream. Now, Lee, turning to the title of your book, Competition yes. and Entrepreneurship, yes. what do the two things have to do with each other? Yes, yes. As I, as I mentioned, in uh, the late 1960s, what came apparent to me was the important difference between a Rabinzian view of the decision and the uh, Misesian view of human action. From this, there became, it became apparent to me that the disagreements, which I have, of course, known for quite a number of years, uh, between uh, the notion of competition as it uh, appears in the mainstream and the notion of competition as it appears in human action, that difference was able to be grasped and understood by me in a way which I had not been able to do so before, not been able to do before. Let me, let me explain. In mainstream economics, competition means the so-called model of perfect competition. The requirements of perfect competition are perfect knowledge, an infinite number of buyers and sellers, Complete freedom and entry of, of complete freedom of entry and exit, and a absolutely homogeneous product throughout the market. Those are the conditions articulated by the late Frank Knight, uh, which are repeated in all our textbooks. That's what competition means. Clearly, that's not the kind of competition that we know in the real world, and it was not the kind of competition that was uh, suffusing the economics that Mises was, was teaching and which he developed in his, in, his, uh, in his work. Competition there meant something quite different. It meant the, the active competition, the dynamic competition, the rivalrous competition that we know in the real world. Now, the mainstream textbooks treat rivalrous competition as, uh, uh, as a crude uh, approximation to the ideal of perfect competition, mm -hmm. uh, they will explain, yes, in the real world there is rivalrous competition because the real world is not yet in the perfect state. But competition in its pure ideal form, as it were, takes the shape and the pattern of the uh, perfect competition with its four uh, requirements. Uh, it became apparent to me that the difference between these two conceptions of competition was fundamental. It was fundamental not merely for the theory of competition, it was fundamental for understanding how the market worked. It was fundamental to understanding what Mises meant when he uh, explained that the market is a process. What he was saying is that the market is a process of dynamic competition where dynamic competition is the fruit of entrepreneurial discovery and insight. In the mainstream model of perfect competition, there is no room for the entrepreneur. The perfect world is a world without the entrepreneur. Whereas in the Austrian world, in the Misesian world, the market process is driven by active dis entrepreneurial discovery. That is the essence. The essence of it was the, uh, the entrepreneurial discovery. The essence of uh, mainstream economics was obtained by filtering out entrepreneur. As I've sometimes put it, to the mainstream economist, the entrepreneur is, analy is an analytical pest, <laughs> is a nuisance. Because they have factors of production, that's all they because have. They have just factors, the mainstream has factors of production. The entrepreneur injects a note of indeterminacy, mm -hmm. which is fatal to the mainstream mode of thinking. Whereas that which is being filtered out in the mainstream turns out to be the essential, uh, the essential feature of Misesian economics. Uh, in one of your books, you make the claim that human beings are motivated to notice that which is to their benefit to notice. Could you explain that quote and also relate it to game theory, which is a recent uh, development in uh, economic science? Let me say a few words about game theory, uh, and then I'll perhaps come back to the first part of your question, Tibor. Uh, 
game theory is certainly not part of Austrian economics, but it has an interesting relationship to Austrian economics. Uh, game theory emerged as a result of the work of uh, Oscar von Morgenstern, Oscar Morgenstern, and of course von Neumann. Morgenstern was an Austrian economist. He was a member of the Mises Seminar. And indeed, game theory emerged as a result of a certain impatience which economists began to feel with the view that decision-making takes place against a given outside world, which is not going to, be t it's not going to impinge back on the decision itself and uh, which the decision-maker takes for granted. In game theory, it began to be realized that a decision is made by an individual taking into account the likelihood that that, dis that decision will elicit a reaction on the part of the others in the system to which he will have to react himself, which he can anticipate. So it's kind now, of a loop. Yes. Okay. Now that, that insight uh, has a certain interesting and fascinating relationship to the fundamental Austrian insights that we've been talking about earlier. Well, let me come back to the first part of your question. I don't believe there is a great deal of relationship, direct relationship between the game theoretic insights that have emerged in, uh, in the last half century, say, and uh, this uh, generalization that, I, that I've made that uh, I individuals are motivated to notice that which it is in their interest to notice. Uh, I believe that this, this assertion is true. I believe it's a fascinating assertion, which is largely a matter of conviction rather than demonstration or, or explanation. I think it's true that if two people walk down a street, each one will see what he's interested to see. Two people will walk down the street and they will come back and report different things that they've seen. And the different things that they will have seen will be the things that have interested them respectively. Consequently, I believe it is true that we do notice that which it is in our interest to notice. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me explain this. It sounds a bit tautological to me. That's one of the puzzles that I have with it. It seems like, well, of course, no, wait, what wait, else wait. is new? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Let, let, let's, remember, let's remember the difference between Robbins and, and, and Mises. Robinsian action, Robinsian decision-making and Misesian human action. Let's remember that for Robbins, the... Uh, the, the context is already known. Now, in a Rabinsian context, the notion of, dis of learning something I didn't know before has to take the form of learning the information which I know that I do not have. For example, I have to look up a telephone number. I know that I don't know the telephone number. I'm ignorant of that telephone number. But I am not ignorant of the fact that I'm ignorant of the, of the phone number. I know that I don't know the phone number, and I know how to, how to get the phone number. I look up the phone book. I look up the number in the phone book. The problem, the Austrian problem is that human beings live in a world in which they very frequently do not know that they are ignorant. They do not know precisely in what respect they are ignorant. Consequently, it might seem that what people learn, not knowing what it is that they didn't know, is purely a matter of chance. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if I'm browsing around in a library, not looking for anything in particular, it would seem to be a matter of pure chance which books are going to fall into my hands. What we're suggesting, though, it is not purely a matter of chance. There is somehow an affinity between what falls into one's hands and what, one's in, what, one, is, what one is interested in. Uh, one notices those books which, in which one has an interest, and one notices those opportunities in which one has an interest. And in that respect, I believe that in Austrian economics, this insight, uh, difficult as it is to explain rationally, uh, I wouldn't say it's trivial, I would say it's in, a, in a way it's, 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 it's remarkable, because we see what's around the corner. To notice what one doesn't know exists, and what doesn't know, one doesn't know about, is to see something that's around the corner. Mm 
And uh, it's very difficult to explain what, how one sees things around the corner and what it is that people will see from around the corner. What is, a, we, we, since we are there, we might as well discuss, what is that famous debate that we all know about, the calculation debate? Give us a short description of that and how much does that distinguish Austrian economics from, say, some other non-socialist, non-central planning or, uh, oriented economic uh, schools? The socialist calculation debate and the Austrian position in that debate, I believe, is one of the most important developments in economic discussion during the 20th century. And I think it will have implications for economics and for social policy uh, for many, many years to come. Uh, let me briefly go over the, the bare outline of the history. Mm -hmm. In 1920, Mises wrote a paper published in a journal in which he pointed out that economic calculation under socialism is impossible. I'm emphasizing the stark word impossible. He did not say that socialism is impossible. He said that socialist calculation is impossible, meaning that central planning uh, is an impossible undertaking. Now, we have to understand the impact which this claim made at the time and the intellectual weight of that particular claim. There had been many debates between socialism and capitalism for many years before 1920. But the possibility of socialist planning had never been in question. The question only was, would the results of socialist planning be better or worse from various ethical or economic perspectives than that which emerges under a free market. But that socialist planning is, is conceivable and possible was never in question. And here comes Mises in 1920 and says, gentlemen, this debate is, is uh, an empty debate. There can be no socialist planning. His reason for making this uh, iconoclastic uh, claim was that under socialism, there are no prices for resources. There are no market prices for the scarce resources that are necessary for production. With, the, with no prices being uh, in place, there is no way in which a central planning authority, no matter how motivated they are, no matter how intelligent they are, no matter how dedicated they are, they are there is no way in which they can calculate the relative importance of different resources so that they can avoid waste. And therefore, they may be using extremely valuable resources for relatively unimportant uh, production objectives. And they would have no way of knowing that they are doing so. That was the core of, of uh, the, the, the Austrian critique of socialism, which Mises made in 1920. It set off a vigorous, bitter debate between the two world wars. Uh, it was during that debate that Hayek joined Mises in the central, in central thesis. He published, a, he, he edited a book entitled <coughs> Collectivist Economic Planning of 1935, in which he brought together the various critiques of the possibility of, of uh, socialist planning. He wrote his own introduction to that book. He wrote his, his own uh, concluding uh, essay on that book. At about the same time, there were attempts by uh, socialist uh, economists, particularly Oscar Lange and uh, uh, Abba P. Lerner, uh, to come up with ideas that might, uh, might permit the uh, possibility of socialist uh, planning. And for a long time, these, these attempts, the Lange-Lerner attempts, were accepted by the mainstream as being valid. And the stories that were told in the textbooks on comparative economic systems were stories that said there was an economist called Mises who raised an important question mm -hmm. about the possibility of socialist planning. Fortunately, fortunately, these problems have been solved by Lange and Lerner. It wasn't until the 1970s and 1980s that it became apparent that these attempts were in fact uh, totally, total failures. Mm -hmm. And the explanation 
for the, fa for the uh, failure of the profession to recognize this has a great deal to do with the difference between mainstream economics and Austrian economics. Uh, there was an interesting observation by Abba Lerner where he s pointed out that Marxism is the economics of capitalism, because of course Marx was analyzing the capitalist system, not the socialist system, mm -hmm. while price theory the theory of price of capitalism turns out to be the economics of socialism. <laughs> and what he meant by that was that, yes, if you take standard equilibrium price theory, there's no reason why you cannot transplant that whole theory to, to a theory of central planning. And it was indeed the whole Misesian view of the entrepreneurial character of the market process and of market prices which explained why no central authority, no matter how well-intentioned, can emulate the results of a market system. Let me again return to your contribution and your emphasis on entrepreneurship. What, if any, implications uh, does your contribution have for public policy, for policy-oriented economic thinking? There are a number of dimensions of uh, potential, potential uh, policy implications. Let me give you an example. Take competition. There is a huge volume of literature on the theory and policy of antitrust. An enormous volume of work has been written over it. One of the things that I learned very early in my exposure to Austrian economics was that to a large extent that literature and those policies, no matter how well-intentioned they may have been, are based on a faulty understanding of uh, how competition works in the real world. Uh, this has a good deal to do with the, the remarks we made uh, earlier in our conversation uh, about uh, the difference between the dynamic competition uh, of uh, Austrians and the uh, perfectly competitive model of the mainstream. The history of antitrust is rather complicated, but I think it's fair to say that over the bulk of the 20th century, antitrust policy has been driven by uh, the false view that the perfectly competitive model represents an ideal to which we must try and approximate, an ideal which we must try and emulate as best we can. And any departure from perfect competition is a step backwards. And any move towards perfect competition is a step forward. I don't believe we've mentioned uh, in our discussion so far the name of uh, Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter. But l let me, let me um, cite his name and his work. Uh, Schumpeter is a, is a whole area that we might want to come back to separately. But um, in 1942, uh, Schumpeter wrote a book a Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy, a famous book, in which he criticized antitrust, in which he criticized the, the, uh, the emphasis on perfectly competitive models. And he criticized it, I believe, from an Austrian perspective. There are powerful, strong reservations about the extent to which Schumpeter sh should be treated or would have wanted to be treated as an Austrian. But there's no question in my mind that his insights on antitrust and his critique of the, perfect, of the applications of the perfectly competitive model came directly out of his training as an Austrian in the seminar of Bern Bawerk in the first decade of the century. And basically what Schumpeter was saying and what I think Mises would have accepted, and I would certainly agree with, is that it is a mistake, it is a, it is a, it is a serious mistake to try and structure a, a, a capitalist economy uh, by tr seeking to make it as closely, uh, as closely consistent with the perfectly competitive model as possible. So it's a serious error. Because by doing so, one is stifling entrepreneurial discovery. One is stifling progress. One is one is locking the system into one which is 
which is confined to a particular set of production possibilities, <coughs> which may in some sense be an ideal allocation of resources at a, moment, at a static point in time, but totally misses the dynamics of a capitalist system, the entrepreneurial vigor, mm -hmm. the discovery procedure, which constitutes the dynamic role of competition. Mm -hmm. But strictly in terms of antitrust, I believe the entrepreneurial insight, I'm coming back to your uh, question a, a few minutes ago as to what policy implications mm, that's right. might emerge from an entrepreneurial insight, I believe this is one of the most important. Uh, if one recognizes the role of entrepreneurship, one recognizes that entrepreneurship does not and cannot be fitted into a model of perfect competition. Mm -hmm. To insist on a, perfect, on a model of perfect competition is to push out entrepreneurship and it is to dry up the, 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 the energy which drives the system as a whole. Now, what this means in practice is that we require for competition one fundamental requirement, one fundamental, one fundamental prerequisite, and that is freedom of entry, which I sometimes uh, write on the blackboard as equal to no privilege. What competition means for Austrians this is true for Schumpeter, as we've seen. It's true for Mises. It's true for Hayek, who wrote a, who wrote a brilliant paper uh, in 1946 entitled The Meaning of Competition. And Mises used to send us as students to read that paper, The Meaning of Competition. What emerges from that is that what competition really means is the freedom of any entrepreneur to enter. Perfect not perfect competition in the model sense, but absolute competition that nobody is blocked from exercising a good idea that he or she may have because somebody else is privileged. No privilege. No monopoly privileges. Nobody should be guaranteed a monopoly. As is well known by now, historically, monopoly privileges were always conferred by the state. The market itself does not, in general, generate monopoly positions. Monopolies were in the past always invariably conferred by the state as a reward to, uh, to faithful service. Uh, so what is required is no privilege. Nobody should be protected from the cold winds of entry, of, of competitive entry, entrepreneurial entry. So recognizing the entrepreneurial character of the market process drives home our understanding of the dynamic force and the beneficial force, the beneficial character of that dynamic force of competitive entry. Yeah. What about uh, the uh, more recent Austrian economists? Let me talk a little bit about Ludwig Lachmann. Ludwig Lachmann was a dear, was a dear friend of mine uh, with whom uh, I disagreed uh, vehemently uh, almost all the time though, that we were together. Uh, Lachmann's own history is quite interesting. He uh, grew up in Berlin. Uh, he studied under, uh, under Werner Sombart, uh, certainly no Austrian economist. Uh, Books can be written about some part, but that's not our concern today. Uh, Lachmann left Germany in 1933, came to London, studied under Hayek. He wrote a, uh, he then went to uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, where, where from about 1950 till the mid 70s, he was, he had the chair of economics at the University of Edwardsrand. He was one of the few economists of his time who welcomed Mises' Human Action. When it was published in 1949, he wrote a glowing review article about it. And uh, he's always been considered a great sympathizer uh, with Austrian economics. However, when one comes down to an analysis of Lachmann's views, they turn out to be really inconsistent with many of the most important of the Misesian uh, insights. Now, this may seem a contradiction. Let me explain. In 1960, I published my first book, The Economic Point of View. Very soon afterwards, I received a letter from Ludwig Lachmann. I was extremely excited by this letter. There ensued a correspondence between Lachmann and myself which extended uh, many, many years. Uh, in the 1970s, we were able to bring Lachmann to New York University uh, to participate in our 
uh, Austrian program. Uh, he attended our, he, were, he was uh, a, 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 one of the most important participants in our weekly colloquium. He taught courses to our students and he had a great, uh, made a great contribution uh, to the emergence of interest, resurgence of interest in Austrian economics at New York University among our students and, and in general. However, when one analyzes Lachman's work, it turns out that what's motivating Lachman is his belief to a radical degree in the absolute freedom indeterminacy of human choice. Not only of human choice, but of human knowledge and expectations. Now, one can understand and appreciate and sympathize with that. To Lachman, however, this meant that nothing in mainstream economics, no systematic equilibration of any kind can be accepted as part of a valid economic understanding. This put him, in my view, entirely apart from the work of Mises. Lachmann himself wrote an article, a fascinating article in the early 70s, entitled From Mises to Shackle. Now, to those who know the name of Shackle, his, his uh, name conveys uh, that of a profound scholar uh, who made extremely important contributions to our understanding of the role of uncertainty. And that is, the, and, and for Lachmann, Mises was nothing but a stepping stone to the work of Shackle. And indeed, uh, again and again, it turns out that on important un issues of understanding the market process, Lachmann was not able to accept the determinacy which even Mises was able to attribute to the market process. Let, let, me, let me give you perhaps a practical example. I think all economists, mainstream Austrians, would understand that there is a tendency for, a, for the price of a single commodity to, uh, to converge, for the prices of a single commodity to converge to a single value within a single market. If milk is being sold in different parts of the same market, it may be a bit more expensive here, a bit cheaper over here, but sooner or later, the prices are going to merge together for the very simple reason nobody's going to pay the higher price if they can get it for a lower price. Nobody's going to sell for a lower price if you can get a higher price. This is the powerful force of competition, which forces tends to bring about a single price throughout the market. I remember Hayek in a seminar uh, 1959, I believe it was, where he, he called this particular insight the fundamental law of economics, the law of the single price. But the law of the single price is nothing else but a law of equilibration. Now, we haven't talked much about equilibrium, but, but uh, obviously Austrian economics are, do not accept the preoccupation with the equilibrium mm -hmm. state, which characterizes much of mainstream economics. However, Austrian economics, uh, following Mises, certainly does pay a great deal of attention to this fundamental economic law that there are powerful forces operating to bring the prices of a single commodity throughout the market uh, into line. Uh, Lachmann would have disagreed. Lachmann would have disagreed with the force of these, with the nature of these forces. And uh, to a large extent, this means that Lachmann's practical economics has to be considered to be different from that of Mises. His insights were profound. He was a man of great intellectual integrity and honesty. And he was a man of profound scholarship, and he really appreciated Mises because he appreciated the extent to which Mises himself had, uh, had departed from the, the mainstream determinacy which uh, Lachmann uh, so, much, uh, so much abhorred. He is an Austrian, kind of an Austrian maverick, if you like, uh, whose work is fascinating and, and shows some of the richness and complexity of Austrian work and may give you a flavor of the kind of disagreements that occurred around the table of our colloquium uh, while Lachmann was at New York University. Who are the other um, more mainstream Austrians who may make a difference in the future of, Austri of the well, Austrian school? Well, we haven't mentioned one very important name, this is Murray Rothbard. Uh, Rothbard was uh, one of the disciples of Mises 
who were attending the Mises Colloquium, the Mises Seminar, when I was a graduate student. Uh, and he, his work has been extremely important in the resurgence of Austrian economics over the past, uh, over the past quarter century. Uh, his unfortunate death a couple of years ago uh, took away a brilliant mind. He was uh, certainly a, uh, an extraordinary, extraordinarily brilliant uh, person, where genius is perhaps not too extravagant a word to use. Um, his work in Austrian economics is complicated by the fact that he believed that it is not necessary and perhaps not possible to separate uh, one's value judgments from one's science. And as a result, uh, his economics and his libertarian ideology came to be almost inextricably intertwined. And uh, that had, I believe, uh, a rather complicated influence on the image which he presented and uh, which, uh, in consequence, Austrian economics as a whole came to present to the economics profession. Uh, my own view is that Austrian economics, if it is to make any professional headway, cannot be intertwined per se with the libertarian ideology. Uh, libertarian ideology, important as it is, and uh, much as I myself, uh, to the large extent to which I share it, uh, cannot, be, cannot be identified with Austrian economics per se. Austrian economics, uh, I, I believe, as I, I mentioned earlier, must be treated as a purely scientific intellectual endeavor uh, from which value judgments have been caref carefully filtered out. Uh, the subsequent uh, deployment of Austrian economics to further libertarian ideals is, is of course, perfectly legitimate. Uh, that's exactly what Mises himself wanted us to do, and, wanted, and himself indeed did. Uh, Rothbard's work, uh, I'm afraid, uh, did not pursue that, that, uh, that pattern, and deliberately so. Uh, so he and I disagreed on that on that particular that particular matter, and uh, we had some other disagreements uh, on matters of doctrine, uh, matters of purely scientific doctrine, which I don't think are of all that Im importance. Uh, certainly, uh, Rothbard had a, a very significant influence on the young people who were attracted to Austrian economics precisely by the libertarian ideology uh, which he championed so effectively. So uh, many uh, people who subsequently pursued scientific careers in Austrian economics may have been introduced into that, into that line of intellectual endeavor precisely by the uh, libertarian uh, political concerns, ideological concerns that Rothbard uh, expressed. Uh, but his role in, 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 in the resurgence is, is unquestioned. You know that in uh, the mainstream uh, of the profession, there has been a, a, an exceeding um, progress in the direction of mathematical modeling. Is this uh, deemed to be entirely uh, misguided uh, from the point of view of the Austrian school, or is there anywhere some sort of a crossover or an affinity that can be found? The relationship between Austrian economics and mathematics is a little complicated. Uh, to the outsider and to the profession as a whole, uh, Austrian economics is sometimes simply identified as non-mathematical economics. Sometimes it's just Austrian economics is described as old-fashioned economics because it's the economics that used to prevail before mathematics took over. I believe that's a quite unfair and false and misleading characterization. Uh, I like to remind myself that Mises was, was a founding member of the Econometric Society I see. back in the early 30s, maybe 1930. Uh, Mises was no mathematical economist. Uh, what I think Austrian economics has to say, what Austrian economists have to say about mathematics and their reservations about it, can be encapsulated, I think, uh, as follows. If one believes that the description and analysis of the equilibrium state constitutes the central task of economic analysis, then the role for mathematics is clear and indisputable.
because uh, mathematics can and should and is able to grapple with the, uh, with the meaning of an equilibrium state. In fact, as is well known by now, as well known for many years, uh, equilibrium represents simply the solution to a set of simultaneous equations. It's been known for a hundred years that that is the case, and to the extent that that's all one has to do, then mathematics would be fine. The problem, as Austrians see it, is that that is a mere footnote to what Austrians, to what economists ought to be doing and should be doing. And that is understanding the market process. That is understanding what forces, if any, are operating to bring about an equilibrating tendency. Uh, one of the most uh, eminent uh, mathematical economists of our generation is Franklin M. Fisher. Uh, he wrote a book uh, some 15, 20 years ago uh, attempting to do exactly this, to spell out mathematically a theory of process, a mm -hmm. theory of an equilibrating process. He labored very, very seriously, with great dedication, uh, many pages, many pages of equations. He employed a number of assumptions necessary to get equilibrating tendencies to work uh, mathematically. And uh, he was honest enough at the end of the story uh, to say it just hasn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. okay. In other words, uh, Austrians are skeptical about the role of mathematics because they believe it diverts attention from the real thing. The real thing, which is the entrepreneurial process, cannot easily, as far as we know, be captured by mathematical, by mathematical uh, regularities. You can't put it in equations. Uh, when, when, I, when you quoted me earlier saying that there is a tendency for um, entrepreneurs to notice that which it is in their interest to notice, it's very difficult to articulate that in the mathematical form. Mm -hmm. It is a tendency. It is not a surefire law. Uh, there are important insights that lead us to expect that to be the case. But it's upon those kinds of insights that cannot easily be captured by the math mathematics that the whole system depends. And that, that is the source of our skepticism as to the direction in which modern economics has gone. I wanted to ask you something. There's an interesting remark by the late George Stigler, who himself is a Nobel laureate, um, to the effect that people in economics tend to veer toward the conservative side of the political spectrum. Do you have any comments about this? Yes, that was in a paper that Stigler wrote, I believe, in 1959. Uh, and uh, he had a point. Many uh, have wondered, what on earth was Stigler talking about? Surely he knows that most economists are not conservative. Uh, most economists believe a, a great deal in uh, government interventions. What on earth did Stigler have in mind? Uh, my understanding is that he meant something which is identical with what a Marxist writer once wrote. I'm talking about a writer by the name of Zweig. I don't remember his first name. But he indeed complained, as a Marxist, that uh, economics uh, inculcates capitalist ideology into young students because it teaches them about the benefits of the free market. And that's exactly what Stigler, what Stigler meant. The word conservatism and conservative are uh, vague words, and they're used uh, somewhat imprecisely. And if, but what Stigler meant, and what Zweig meant, is that it is very difficult to, enter, to learn economics, even if you learn it from a non-Austrian. It's very difficult to learn economics and avoid understanding something about the, powerful, the powerfully coordinative uh, function and tendencies <laughs> which free markets indeed uh, provide. And if one understands that, then one understands that well-meaning interventions uh, have to be looked at rather skeptically. As soon as one understands well, well, a little bit of price theory, uh, one understands that price fixing I I is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, I very often 
uh, discovered that putting a simple supply and demand diagram on a blackboard, not an Austrian diagram, mm -hmm. a standard <laughs> mainstream supply and demand diagram, drawing a line below the equilibrium point and pointing out the consequences of a price ceiling at that point, pointing out the, the resulting shortages, how a demand exceeds a supply, is powerfully, in, is powerfully interesting to students. It, it gets them to see something which they hadn't seen before. The great debate in the history of economics has, between, has been between those who understand the nature of economic law, in quotes, and the denial of economic law. Mm -hmm. The enemies of economics, and I'm using a Sessian phrase, the enemies of economics, that means <laughs> those who have denied the, uh, the validity of economic theory, have in effect said there are no regularities that govern economic behavior. In which case? there is ample scope for well-meaning, well-intentioned governments to fix things up. Mm -hmm. If things, uh, things look bad, do something about it. Yeah. Whereas those who understand the role of economic law understand that sometimes the things that people want to do to fix things up are going to make things worse. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful interview. Tibor, it's been a pleasure talking with you.